Good afternoon. <coughs> Thank you all for coming. Uh, my name is Dahi O'Kalik. I'm the chair of the UK group in the Institute for International and European Affairs. And personally, um, I've had some connection with the UK. I spent uh, 11 years in the Irish Embassy in London, six of them as ambassador. So I'm reasonably familiar with government and administration uh, in London. At least I hope I am. Uh, thank you all for coming. The, the format is I'll say a few words followed by my four colleagues who will say a few words each. And then we're open for question and answer and discussion. And everything is on the record. There's nothing off the record. And the purpose of coming here is just to, to launch uh, this report from the Institute, Brexit a Status Report. I hope you all have a copy. Uh, it's really designed to provide information about how the negotiations uh, might be conducted. It's intended to be a, a reference guide. Uh, and it doesn't take any sides uh, on any of the issues. It's just intended to be something that's useful, something that's readable uh, for people who are interested in the coming negotiations. Uh, there are 11 uh, chapters which are divided into five sections. The first pretty much sets the scene, the, the context. Uh, and Brendan Halligan has written that uh, first chapter, and he'll talk about that in a few moments. Uh, and Tony Brown has uh, dealt with, the, with the, what's happened uh, since the referendum up until now. And believe it or not, he even has a paragraph on the May speech, uh, which happened yesterday. Um, the second deals with preparations within the EU. And the two cha one chapter has been written by the Brussels branch of the IIEA, and the other by Catherine Day, uh, who's probably uh, the most distinguished Irish person. Uh, to work as an international uh, civil servant. And it's a great pleasure, Catherine, that you're here. Uh, um, and then there is uh, a chapter on the UK written by Paul Gillespie, the first one, and the second one by John Palmer. Paul concentrating really on the issues from a London point of view and John somewhat on the issues from a Brussels point of view. And finally, uh, the last uh, two sections, section D, are the implications for Ireland and the last section are the implications for business. Now, I think it's beyond doubt that Brexit is one of the greatest challenges that has faced this state. Um, and it's going to require enormous effort uh, on the part of the Irish government and of Irish business to ensure that our interests are protected and to ensure that we come out of this negotiations, which could last for a very long time, that we come out of them uh, with as vibrant and as good an economy then as uh, we have now. Uh, there are, I think, uh, three particular areas that are important. Well, there are more than three, but there are three in, in particular. There's our trade with the UK which is important for our smaller companies in particular, and very important for agriculture and for our agribusiness. It's the common travel area, but the one for me, I think, which is really the most important is Northern Ireland, and it's the one about which I personally am most concerned, because the difficulties in Northern Ireland, and we've seen them to the fore in the last few weeks, those difficulties were solved over a very long period, more than 30 years by two governments in London and in Dublin, by politicians in London and in Dublin, and by civil servants in London and in Dublin, who had, within the European Union, learned to work together and to resolve differences together. And what really worries me is that over the coming years, that that very close relationship between London and Dublin, that that will, to some extent, atrophy uh, because of the fact that we will be in one camp and they will be outside. Now, I said that there are no opinions expressed uh, in the status report, but you might forgive me or bear with me if I give you a few opinions myself. Nothing to do with the report. The first is, really, it is good that we've had the May speech yesterday. We now know what the British want. Uh, and I think it is better that we know what they want. But frankly, there was nothing particularly new in the speech. 
uh, those of you who have read the book that we published two years ago, uh, where we argued for a bespoke arrangement for the UK. We argued for that bespoke arrangement within the European Union. They unfortunately took a decision to have a bespoke arrangement outside the European Union. But there's nothing particularly new in the issues. What I think is good about yesterday is, firstly, that there's been clarity that they've said they're going to leave uh, the single market. They have effectively said they're going to leave the customs union. They're going to introduce uh, regulations for immigration. Uh, and they're going to distance themselves from the European Court uh, of, for ju of Justice. Where is it all going to end up? We certainly don't know when, but I think we're likely to end up with a free trade agreement or a series of free trade agreements dealing with different sectors. How difficult they will be to negotiate, I don't know, but I think that's where we're likely to be. And they'll be supplemented, likely, by various other agreements to cover things like foreign affairs, maybe defence, and so on. <coughs> so there'll be a series of agreements. And Mrs May made clear yesterday that she doesn't want, she doesn't want a, an instant break. Uh, she wants things to, to, um, to change smoothly. And that should be helpful for Irish business. It should be helpful for those trying to sell into the British market and trying to, to compete uh, with the British. So that's on the positive side. On the negative side, I have to say I didn't like at all the threats uh, that were contained in the speech. Um, uh, um, this negotiation will be successful to the extent that both sides are helpful to one another. And uh, I don't think threats uh, are ever helpful. But at least we know uh, where it's likely to end up. There has been a lot of talk and a lot of worry in this country about the future. I'd like to end on a positive note. I'm old enough to remember what this country was like 40, 50 years ago. It was very poor. There was very little opportunity for people in this country. This country has changed profoundly and changed profoundly for the better. It's probably been the most successful country economically in the European Union over the last 40 years, in spite of the difficulties and particularly in spite of the recession uh, five, six, seven, eight years ago. It's been a very successful country. I see no reason whatsoever why this country cannot be equally successful in the future as we go into a Brexit. And I think it behoves all of us here to support the government in its attempts to ensure the best outcome for this country. That's not in the report. So I now invite, if I may, uh, Brendan Halligan. Uh, good afternoon, and uh, thank you, Dahi, for opening this uh, presentation. And thank you all for coming, indeed, to the launch of the um, status report. I think you can take it that, as uh, Ireland's leading think tank, that the Institute has been looking at this uh, issue for quite some time, in fact, over 25 years. And um, <clears throat> we've now come to this uh, s seminar here today. Uh, we have uh, published three books, as Dahi has said, over those 25 years, numerous uh, reports, and we currently have on our website, which I invite you all to look at if you haven't seen it already, a Brexit brief, which is giving you a reportage, listing what's happening and giving you links to all the various documentation. And we've just begun to publish what we call Brexit Intelligence, which is an analysis of what's happening for the busy executive and or civil servant. And now this uh, <coughs> status report. The instructions, as Dahi said, with regards to the status report were simple. You write no more than 1,500 words, you keep it the facts and you eschew personal opinion. Uh, and now we have Mrs. May. So the first thing I want to do is thank her for having timed our speech for yesterday. It was <coughs> most convenient and uh, we're very, very grateful to her. But the first point to make, I think, in response to it, as Dahi has said, is that there's nothing new in the speech and this was to be expected. What we have looked at, what we have seen, our conclusions have been over 25 years that ultimately politics was going to dominate economics. This is a, as a result of a, a movement in terms of English nationalism. 
So <coughs> immigration controls have been given primacy over all other considerations, along with ending the jurisdiction of the, of the European Court of Justice and, and with a desire to keep transferring, uh, making a financial contribution. So those three priorities added together, the logic of it is that <clears throat> you sacrifice membership of the single market and indeed of the customs union and you reimpose customs and passport controls and as she said yesterday you conclude something like a free trade area agreement with the U European Union as a third country because the point is now that all the <clears throat> rights and obligations that arise from being a signature to treaties will end on a particular day and at that point Britain becomes a third country. So to, to uh, use an expression uh, that she used herself yesterday, I think to put everything in perspective, uh, they're fully out. There's no half in and half out. What we don't know, Dahi has already alluded to, and I think it's as very important to us today in the status report to, uh, to assess what it is we don't know. As he has said, we don't know what the contents of the free trade area agreement is going to be like. We don't know the form of it either. And <clears throat> we don't know, equally important for us on this island, as to how the common travel area is going to be maintained, despite the good intentions of both, of both governments. I think, however, the, one of the most important things that we don't know is the relationship between Article 50 of the Treaty on European Union and Article 218 of the, of the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union. We don't know whether or not these are going to run in parallel or run in sequence. Mrs May is certainly of the view that they will run in parallel. <coughs> she refers to the fact that Article 50 makes reference to the new arrangement between the outgoing Member State and the European Union. And she says you can't, make, you can't make reference to something that doesn't exist. On the other hand, Article 218 is very clear that it's designed to, to uh, handle the processes for concluding a trade agreement between a third country and the European Union. In other words, you can't really get into it on, until such time as Brits have actually left the European Union. There's a dilemma here, there's a catch-22, and uh, how it's going to be solved, I'm, I'm not quite sure. That means that <coughs> following the day in which British membership ends of the European Union, there could be two transition periods, not just one, as, as has been talked about. There could be a period <coughs> for, to do with the running down of the acquis communautaire on the one hand, and running in the new arrangement on the other. But there could also be a period simply to get to the new arrangement. Now, all of that has got profound implications for business because it could elongate uh, the, the whole period of getting to a stage where we actually know what, what's happening. The other thing that she did not mention yesterday, which I think adds to the uncertainty about timing, is that there's going to be a bill to be paid by the United Kingdom for disengaging itself from the European Union. As you know, the figures being brooded about at the moment, in Brussels particularly, vary between 40 and 60 billion, with a lot of emphasis on the upper end of that spectrum, 60 billion. Also, the intelligence would indicate that, from the point of view of the Union, that this is to be the first issue to be sorted out before anything else is agreed. So you can imagine that that can take quite some time, and it leads into a very limited timetable anyway. You all would have seen what Barnier said about the division of the, of the two years, really leaving yourself with just a little over a year's actual uh, negotiating time. So we don't know uh, what's going to come first here. Uh, and um, we don't, the real problem is, I think, that the debate about uh, the, the, the bill could delay the timetable, and if it does delay the timetable beyond two years, you're into really serious political water here. Because you have a, a European elections just shortly after the expiry of the two years. The incoming European Parliament will need at least four to five months to get up and running, and all that's a wasted time if you want. 
Uh, and of course, at the very end of this, it's got to give uh, its assent uh, to, the, to the whole deal. But where that extra time to spill over for 12 months or more, you're now into the uh, British general election in 2020. So all of this could be quite problematic, to say the least of it. And we're not talking about what uh, else might happen in other countries such as France and in Germany. The next phase of this um, study of ours will be on what we call at the beginning, when we're setting the scene, is, a, is an asymmetric shock. Because our belief is that Ireland will be, obviously, will be more disproportionately affected than, than any other country, both politically and economically. Politically, we don't have to explain why, because of Northern Ireland. Uh, but economically, as Dahi has mentioned about trade, there's also the things like, such as free movement. But for me, which I mentioned in my opening chapter, it has always been uh, a fear of mine from the very beginning, and that is to say the disadvantageous movements in the exchange rate between the euro and, and sterling. So devaluation, I think, is the greatest threat to our continuing competitiveness. As we've seen, the pound is depreciated by approximately 20% since, uh, since the, since the um, decision. And what I would now think, drawing on a historical analogy, is that we need something like we had in 1979 when we joined the European monetary system. Uh, we, we did so, obviously everybody knew what the risks were at that time, and both France and Germany went out of their way uh, to facilitate us by giving us very major loans at the time at very reasonable rates. And later on, of course, we had the, the cohesion funds. I think that something along those lines are needed now, and I was interested to see that this point came up uh, yesterday in the Doyle. So that's the challenge ahead as to how we're going to get through this period which will, of adjustment, which in my view will take the economy at least 10 years. So to summarize what Dahi has said, <coughs> the three issues were trade, uh, free movement, and Northern Ireland, and to which I have added as a, the asymmetric shock. Thank you. So good afternoon, everybody. I'm going to go a little bit deeper into some of the nitty gritty of how will the negotiations actually happen. Um, it's new territory because um, Article 50 exists for the first time in the Treaty of Lisbon. So it's untested, but it's a relatively short and relatively clear article. It's triggered by the member state that wants to leave, and there's a two-year time period for the uh, exit to be negotiated. It can be extended by unanimity, but I don't think that's likely to happen. Now, um, as we saw in Prime Minister May's speech yesterday, actually the more interesting and more difficult uh, thing to negotiate will be the separate negotiation on the future relationship between the EU and the United Kingdom. And uh, in practice, both are linked because we will have to have answers to a lot of questions written into the Article 50 agreement uh, before we can conclude it. And that will then uh, shape quite a lot of the negotiations on the future relationship, as I'm going to talk a little bit about in a moment. Um, I think everybody agrees that yesterday's speech did clarify a number of issues, and they will certainly help with the Article 50 negotiations. Uh, Prime Minister May's speech was clear that the UK wants to be out of the single market, uh, out of the common commercial policy, and out of the common external tariff. And note, I don't say out of the customs union, because I think parts of the speech um, don't quite say that. I think the speech was clear at a high level of generality, but of course it was uh, of necessity perhaps lacking in detail. Um, and it was an opening bid. Uh, I think she was setting out um, basically something close to, well, we'd like a good deal with uh, very little obligations, and how else would you start uh, such a negotiation? So a lot more detail has to come. Um, the successor negotiations of what kind of relationship uh, the EU wants to have with the UK and the UK wants to have with the EU will of necessity take a long time. It's not only because there are 28 countries involved, it's also because uh, unravelling a relationship that has been built up over 40 years is intrinsically difficult. Um, and given the level of ambition set out by Prime Minister May yesterday, um, it is likely to be what the EU calls a mixed agreement, requiring agreement of all uh, member states and all parliaments. And as we saw with the uh, 
recent travails of getting the Canada Agreement across the line, even the Walloon Parliament and lots of other parliaments uh, will have their say. So of necessity, it's going to be um, a long, uh, drawn-out uh, experience. And um, I was glad to see in the speech yesterday the recognition of the need for transitional arrangements. Um, because that is, is um, very, very clearly going to be necessary. Um, the successor agreement cannot be in place on the first day after the UK uh, officially leaves the, leaves the EU. Um, the speech also implied the, a desire to have different transition periods, and we'll have to see what the other 28, 27 member states make of that. Now, in procedural terms, the negotiations are going to be conducted by the Commission, that's um, the norm in trade negotiations. It's also, interestingly, the norm in accession negotiations. So here we have the opposite of an accession negotiation. But of course, every member state will follow very, very closely. So there will be um, uh, very, very regular debriefings. Uh, President Tusk's um, staff will be represented in the Commission negotiating team, as will the rotating presidency. And uh, Coraper, the General Affairs Council, will have a key role in preparing um, the European Councils, which I expect to discuss this issue at every single meeting they will have uh, for several years to come. What kind of successor agreement could there be? Um, first of all, it's clear, and it's more clear since yesterday, that it will be uh, tailor-made, it will be sui generis. But of course, we already have a lot of examples to draw on. And over many years, the EU has concluded free trade agreements with lots of um, third countries. And over the years, these agreements have gone well beyond just uh, trade in goods. So they now include a whole lot of other things from obviously trade in services, but also uh, some have um, justice and home affairs uh, cooperation in them. Some have cultural cooperation in them. So um, there are examples to draw on and each one is tailor made in the end of the day. Um, an issue that I think will start to become clear um, is the extent to which um, the e UK will still be bound by EU rules and regulations after it leaves. And I think this is beginning to dawn on, on parts of UK business. Um, because in order to sell to, your, to the European Union, European Union rules will apply. And just like Norway, I think there will be a frustration in the British civil service and in the British uh, business community that they will not have an influence over shaping future EU policy, but they will, of course, be, be bound directly by it. But you can't have your cake and eat it, and that's one consequence of, of leaving the EU. It's also clear, I mean, it's very clear that the two things the UK wants to escape from is um, uh, freedom of movement and the control of the European Court of Justice. But uh, for any free trade agreement to work, there has to be a dispute settlement mechanism. What happens when all the good intentions fail to materialise and there's a breach or a perceived breach of an agreement. So there will have to be still some sort of supranational way of sorting out disputes uh, in the regulations to come and that will also be part of uh, putting a final, a final agreement together. Um, I think um, there is a lot of discussion about how will these two discussion, negotiations run in parallel. It's clear legally that the EU can't n conclude a free trade or any other kind of agreement with uh, the UK until it becomes a third country. But that doesn't mean that a lot can't be worked out in advance. Um, and uh, I think in practice, discussions will run in parallel. They will not be concluded, but they will have to run in parallel because to a certain extent anyway, uh, what will be written into the Article 50 agreement will then be taken up in the successor agreement. I think the Commission has maybe been misunderstood on that. I don't think the Commission has ever said, and certainly doesn't intend, that we will have no discussion with the UK before it actually leaves the Union on what the successor relationship will be. That would not make sense. That would lead to uh, even more disruption than we're likely to face at the moment. But of course, um, both legally but also technically, it won't be possible to neatly conclude the two sets of negotiations in two years and then have one smoothly take over from the other, simply because of the amount of time, the amount of people involved, and the amount of detail that will have to be, to be sorted out. Um, I don't believe either that the EU will be vengeful or punitive um, uh, in these negotiations. I think everybody will approach uh, the negotiations with a very hard-headed sense of what is their own self-interest. It would be naive to believe it would be anything other than that. Um, I think that the special case of, of Ireland and Northern Ireland has been very well accepted uh, by the Brussels institutions and by the other 27 member states. Uh, but the details have to be worked out. 
And while I think um, the special case on the common travel area has been accepted, we don't have a special case on the economic or trade matters. There, every country in the EU is competing with every other country. And so those will be, be tough, tough negotiations. Um, I think that, and this is an important point that I think hasn't received enough coverage yet, Brexit will also mean inevitably that the EU will now reshape itself. Um, the loss of um, the UK budget contribution is clearly one of the early triggers. Um, taking away 17, 18% of the EU budget doesn't mean that it's business as usual. And that's going to be an early uh, sign of the change. But more importantly, I think politically, in terms of EU future integration, um, we are going to have to have a debate here um, about what is our view on how differently the EU will look in 10, 20 years' time from what we would have thought about before the 23rd of June last year. Um, I think that it will inevitably be more continental, um, and that may not always be to, to our taste. So I think there is going to be an ongoing need for Ireland to network much more intensively with uh, other small, like-minded member states uh, to make sure that we are very active and have our say and uh, advocate our views in terms of where the EU is going to go next. And for me, that will also mean the need for much more public engagement here and much more debate in Ireland about uh, what it is we get out of the EU. He said very passionately, and I, I couldn't agree more, that Ireland has been perhaps the major beneficiary of, um, of EU membership. But we will have to go back and rethink now uh, and think differently about what do we want from the next generation um, of EU membership. <coughs> I want to just finish with a couple of um, comments on what are the issues for the EU and um, what will the other 27 be thinking about? I think um, the phrase cherry picking has already been done to death in the last 24 hours, but that will be one of the things that the EU will try to avoid. And I, reading the speech, I thought, well, it's no accident that Prime Minister May has mentioned cars and financial services. Those are key sectors for the British economy, but they're also key sectors for other member states' economies. So um, the idea that you can have the deal you want on the sectors that are important to you uh, and you don't have to take account of anybody else's wishes is simply not a realistic negotiating target. It may be a good opening bid, but it's not a, a realistic negotiating position. I think a lot of work is being done and will have to be done on what kind of customs cooperation do we want to have. Uh, as I said already, to sell into European market, into EU markets, um, EU rules apply. Um, and there will be a big issue for uh, checking rules of origin if the UK is not going to be bound by the common external tariff. And as we know, the modern world is not like the old fashioned one where goods were put on a ship and they arrived in a port. Now we have multiple entry exit of intermediate stages in producing goods, uh, not to mention all the complexity of the modern services sector. So we will have to see what, uh, what kind of checks uh, will be put in place to um, allow uh, the kind of degree of customs cooperation that Mrs May um, <coughs> set out in her speech yesterday. Um, the finance issue, uh, not only the loss of the UK contribution to the EU budget, but also um, what will the UK have to pay for access to the European market in the future. Um, other countries that have access to the single market pay uh, into the EU budget. Uh, at the moment, that money only goes to the new member states. Um, so there are many, many questions that will have to be worked through in the future. And the other member states um, will be looking very carefully at what kind of special deals are done because they will want to avoid contamination. And I think it was no accident that the Taoiseach was very recently in Madrid talking to the Spanish authorities, who will keep a very close eye um, on what kind of special arrangements are made between Ireland, the UK, and Northern Ireland. Um, there is also the question of what happens to EU citizens in the UK and British citizens living in the rest of the EU. And um, while uh, probably many member states would like to do a deal quickly on that, my feeling is that everything will, will remain to be agreed at the end because everything is now a bargaining chip and I doubt if um, many member states would be willing to sign up to something partial until they see the, the full shape of the whole deal. So that will be important. Um, and finally, the transition arrangements and what apl rules apply during them. So probably, to all intents and purposes, the day after the UK leaves will feel very much like the day before they left. 
because um, it is going to take time to work out the transitional arrangements to put alternative arrangements in place. Um, like it or not, this is going to take quite a long time. And I think um, if, um, and we, we will come to, I imagine, very tense moments in the negotiations, but the option of simply saying, OK, we've had enough and there's no deal possible, therefore we walk away from it, isn't realistically an option either, because to not have an agreement in place with the EU means falling back on WTO rules, WTO rules. Uh, but they also take time to negotiate, and with far more members than the 27 of the EU. So um, I think we're in for a lot of mind-numbing, tedious uh, technical negotiations that will float up to the political level every so often and then go down again into the committee rooms uh, in Brussels. I think um, there will be um, the will to succeed, because this is very important for all kinds of reasons, but I think it will be a hard-headed negotiation and we need to be prepared for that. Thank you. I want to start, though, with a bit of a political point, not a party political point, but a political point, and that is that it remains at the level of very much a draft political project. That is to say, uh, as has been typical, frankly, of successive leaders of the Conservative Party in recent years, it's drawn up with two audiences in mind, internal audiences in mind. Obviously, following the referendum, the very narrow but nonetheless clear referendum decision, uh, the uh, Eurosceptic wing of not only the Conservative Party but of the, its electoral, uh, uh, the wider electorate. But secondly, there remains in the Conservative Party, certainly in the Parliamentary Conservative Party, actually a majority of MPs who are as yet far from convinced about the risks and the dangers involved in the entire project. And I think it's perhaps helpful to see what uh, Prime Minister May has been doing in recent months as alternately offering reassurance to the different wings of the party. And I think this document is a stage in that process. And let me give you a few examples of, of what I mean. I think this paper definitely tilts the balance towards a harder Brexit uh, than appeared to be the case even uh, 48 hours ago. Uh, on the one hand, and it's clear, and other speakers have made this point, that the dominant motive is the need to be seen regaining control of borders, control of labor movement, control, control of free movement of EU citizens uh, to the UK. But notice, on the other hand, less attention has been perhaps given to this, that in one sector after another, the government are sotto voce making it clear that they will not be uh, included in the new regime. For example, some of them are fairly obvious. The National Health Service could not possibly continue to function, and it does so at the moment with great difficulty, without an enormous infusion doctors, medical experts of all kinds, nurses, not just from the European Union, but very significantly from the European Union. It's already clear that the NHS is just one of a number of sectors where the new rules, whatever they will be, and we don't know much about them, whether it's quotas, whether it's the need to have prior uh, employment <coughs> agreements before you can move, is, is, uh, are not going to apply in the science sector, uh, the wider science sector, which is of critical importance and probably has the greatest political danger to the government if it goes wrong, because not only do the British uh, science faculties and universities play a, a very important part in the European Union's research program, in many cases they play a leadership role in the European Union's uh, uh, research programs. And with it goes a great deal, therefore, of the funding for British scientific uh, research. Uh, High-tech sectors of one kind or another have also been told that they will be able to freely attract people coming from the rest of the European Union. Seasonal workers in agriculture is another sector, and, th and there are others. I don't want to overstress any of these points, uh, but what uh, it's a little bit like a complicated polka dance, first this way and then that way, which is designed to meet 
objections and reassure people, but at the end carries the risk that it will satisfy neither side. Because when the impact of all the ex exemptions from the new migration rules as yet to be determined emerge, it may well be people say, but it's made little or no difference. Uh, so I think that is the first point I want to make about the, the volatility that lies, the political volatility that lies beneath the attempt by the government to spell out a coherent negotiating uh, strategy. Then the, uh, there are other issues which I think um, ha have yet to be fully addressed. Uh, the question not just of existing social rights, labor movement rights for British workers and employees, uh, but of to what extent the government would be committed to match future progress at the European level so that uh, Britain, as, an, as it were, doesn't get left behind in the way that might be seen as implied in some of the remarks that have been made in the last 24 hours about the fact that the UK returns, uh, reserves the right to adopt a completely different economic model if the negotiations don't succeed, which the Chancellor went so far in Berlin as to imply, but not quite state, might be some kind of tax haven approach with all the implications for lowering of standards, uh, cheapening of uh, uh, labor costs in order to achieve competitiveness that way, uh, which has already led um, to questions being raised in, in the UK uh, by the wider labor movement. So there are, there are real elements of unpredictable volatility in the situation. <coughs> now, uh, Catherine has quite rightly uh, identified and very clearly identified the extraordinary, I think, unprecedented time frame within which all of this is meant to happen. It isn't two years, of course. It is at the best 18 months, because at least six months will have to be left for the ratification process if there is an agreement and it emerges from it. And, uh, uh, of course, informal talks, as she rightly said, are certain to begin in parallel with the divorce negotiations, the withdrawal negotiations, including the money to be paid, uh, including a, a, a lot of other tricky issues. Uh, uh, but uh, informal talks are one thing. When things are put on paper in formal negotiations, difficulties can emerge that don't clearly emerge at the level of, let's have a chat so we get each other's viewpoint as to where you want to go and where we would be prepared to go. So I think that there must be a very significant political question mark over the doability of this entire timetable for what is being talked of. Uh, the nature of any transitional period, and there will be an urgent necessity for a several different transitional periods, according to the way we're going at the present time, uh, it seems to me uh, also can't seriously begin until the withdrawal principles are finally agreed and established. And there is a very real risk that the clock will simply run out. And uh, I think, uh, again, Catherine is no more than realistic in saying people aren't going to be rushing to s extend the clock indefinitely uh, if that is the case. And this brings me to another point, which is, again, frankly political, but I think it's perhaps um, interesting to an Irish audience to get the sense of the, the politics of it across the water. What happens when it's brought back to the House of Commons and the House of Lords? What happens when whatever agreement there is, uh, if it's a mini agreement, if it's a mini transitional agreement, if it's a bigger agreement, whatever. Uh, here we encounter a quite different set of problems the government may face. Frankly, it can't count automatically on its present parliamentary majority guaranteeing passage of whatever is agreed, no matter what. Don't need to take my word for that. There are very many imp leading members of the Conservative Party, including former ministers, that have spoken outright about their objections to the entire process. But of course they uh, couldn't, and indeed you might argue democratically should not have tried to block the beginning of the Article 50 process, but the conclusion of the Article 50 process, whenever it arises, is a very, very different, a very, very different kettle of fish. And I think that uh, 
whether it is in the second half of uh, 20, uh, 2019, 20, hang on, it begins in March uh, 2017, so 18 months would be, bring us to December 2018, six months before, or a few months before the expiry of the, of the uh, two-year period, there's going to be a very, very fraught debate and an unpredictable debate, and in my personal opinion, by no means an insured, assured debate for the outcome that the government wants. I think the risks of that going wrong are far greater than have been generally recognized. When the kind of price that will have to be paid in principle for the very limited access that they are likely to secure to the single market uh, 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 on the terms that are likely to be forthcoming, uh, uh, and given the fact that the closer they look at the WTO process and all the tripwires <coughs> that that contains, I think their bargaining situation will not get obviously stronger the longer the negotiating timescale passes. And then there is another major open question lying behind, <coughs> domestic question in the UK, lying behind the government's negotiating strategy, uh, uh, Cardiff, uh, Edinburgh and uh, Belfast. Um, it would be particularly disastrous if there was no administration in Belfast for any significant length of period ahead while this is all going on. And I think it wouldn't be so much a matter of dispute between the two traditional communities. I think there could well be a common assent that they need an administration. One question that is being asked for which there is no clear answer at the moment is, in the repatriation of powers that is sought in the British withdrawal negotiation, who are the beneficiaries of the transfer of powers? In other words, what goes to London the kind of way it's spoken of, the repatriation of powers, uh, the assumption is everything goes to London. But that isn't the case any longer. Certainly the implications of the constitutional settlements, the so-called devolution settlements, which are becoming more than just minimal devolution, I think raise very important questions and there's likely to be serious competition between the emerging different power centres in the UK system uh, between the devolved administrations as a whole uh, and, uh, and London. In the case of Wales, for example, it, it actually works in a way that you, you mightn't imagine. They are not at all anxious to have responsibility for the Welsh agricultural policy, given the costs that would be imposed upon the Welsh budget. It's something that they wouldn't want foist upon them, whereas in many other issues, Edinburgh and, uh, and Cardiff certainly will be looking to add to their powers because they would, they will argue rightly, should be the inheritors under the devolved uh, arrangements of the, returned, of the returned powers. I want to just add two final points which you may think are a bit adjacent to this report, excellent report and a very clear report. Uh, and that is, we speak, Theresa May spoke quite openly and positively about the whole question of uh, Britain's, her desire to work as closely as possible and with great friendship and in close amity with our European neighbours, as she puts them, on security and defence. Now it's one thing to say this uh, when uh, one could assume that the architecture of Western security and defence was impermeable and in place and not likely to change in any way, irrespective of these negotiations. But following the election of President Trump, I don't think that can be taken for granted. I don't think it necessarily follows that the <coughs> alliance structure, the NATO alliance structure, as we have, will survive unscathed the next four years. I'm not going to predict because I have no idea, absolutely no idea of which direction it could go in but to hear what is being said by the incoming leaders of the new administration a great deal. And that, I think, could put the UK in a particularly awkward situation a year or two hence, when it may not be able to count upon the permanence and uh, unchanged nature of the uh, NATO alliance's operation in building on and seeking 
to keep a, a, a handle on the nature of European security and defence development. So I don't want to add anything that's been said uh, uh, to the Northern Ireland thing. I found it interesting that the Prime Minister was unable to say much more than any controls on the border would be as frictionless as possible. Um, I'm not quite sure that meets the kind of um, political tests that will, and security tests that it may be subject to in the future. <clears throat> My very last point then is, is to say that <clears throat> yes, the option for a harder Brexit out of the single market, out of the common commercial policy, and effectively uh, uh, out of the customs union, uh, seeking only external relationships with it, uh, is, a very, is, is at the radical end of the spectrum that might have been imagined. Uh, I think it would be wrong not to believe the government is serious about it, but it might be equally foolish to imagine that this government will have the political lasting power, staying power, to be able to carry the implications of the whole process through to the end. I wonder whether in that vote that takes place at the end of the process, we mightn't be faced with the choice of, e if it's defeated, of either a new referendum or a general election or the incurring of a withdrawal of Article 50, which is still possible within the two-year period, as Jean-Claude Piris, the great legal expert on these matters, has uh, made clear. Either way, we could find ourselves in as unpredictable a situation as we currently face as a result of the events of the last few weeks. Thank you. You may think there's not a lot extra to say after those three uh, excellent contributions, and uh, you may <laughs> well be right. But I'd like to start by, I suppose, putting this report in a, in a context. And the context was described at the beginning by Brendan. This is the latest output in a 20-odd-year contribution uh, to thinking about relationships between Britain and the European Union with a specific reference to the implications for Ireland. And when we tried at the end of this report to pull together what were, what were the key issues from an Irish perspective, the conclusion was that there are indeed three interconnected themes central to the Brexit negotiation and outcome. They've all already been touched upon, but to, to re restate them, the Irish government's capacity to influence the EU negotiating position while retaining productive links with the UK government and administration. Secondly, finding a solution to the specific challenges posed by Northern Ireland. And thirdly, developing policy aimed at securing Irish compet economic competitive post-Brexit, taking the longer term view of what needs to be done in this substantial change in the external environment which faces us. And I'd just like to briefly reflect on each of these. In terms of the government influence on the EU position, we're clearly just beginning to, to, to and the May speech has, has helped in this regard, to, to, to get a clearer sense of what the, the, the basic framework of this negotiation would be. But as expressed particularly by Catherine and, and John, uh, there needs to be a very acute awareness about the scale of the challenge of succeeding in or concluding a negotiation within the time frame that we're, that we're talking about. The atmospherics of that political negotiation are going to be crucial. And to some extent, it could be argued that the, some of the contributions, if some of the context of Mrs. May's speech yesterday don't help in that as atmospherics. But I think what the, what, at the end of the day, what Catherine said, this will ultimately be a negotiation, a hard-headed negotiation based on self-interest self of the parties on both sides of the table. And the hope has to be that there will be uh, a pragmatic, uh, pragmatic conclusion and leading on to uh, a sensible arrangement in regard to transitional arrangements. The other aspect is that we, and I think we have to be very clear about this, that whereas Brexit looms large in all of our thoughts, Brexit is not 
going to be the only thing that's been happening in it, that is going to happen in the European Union. The European Union is going to have to think ahead over the next five to ten years as to the policies, the priorities, etc. And this is going to represent a challenge for Ireland, uh, and it, it's going to come back to identifying very clearly what do we, what direction do we want the European Union to go in over that period? What are our priorities? Who are our allies in attempting to secure that? So that seems to me to be part, uh, if you like, of the the whole our whole positioning within Europe over the next five to ten years. The second issue, and it is really specific to Ireland, is the Northern Ireland challenge. And here, it's it has to be very clear that the logic of Mrs. May's priorities yesterday are that it will be very difficult to achieve some of the other objectives that the politicians state they want to achieve. You actually cannot have uh, uh, both a, an exit from the customs union and the single market and not have the return of a border within the, this island. I mean, that's the logic of what, what you, what you what, that's the logic of that position. So how do you square what are positives in terms of political sentiments, in terms of no return of a hard border, maintenance of the common travel area, how do you square that with practical policies? And we're only beginning to, to I think, see wh wh some possibilities. We're talking about frictionless trade on the basis that something akin to what happens work, works between Norway and Sweden. How can that be further developed and, 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 uh, and worked on? The question of, of the people, the, uh, how do you achieve the common travel area? That's obviously, there's still a lot of work to be done in that regard. And then there is, again, the, what the politics of this is going to be over the next period of time. When the First and Deputy First Minister wrote to the British government in August, uh, they talked about a triangular relationship between Dublin, Belfast and London. How is that going to be achieved? particularly in the context of not having an executive in Northern Ireland. The third area, and it is the one that is, you know, it requires us to do some longer term thinking, is taking account of the, the reality that we're going to be in a colder economic space and more challenging economic space post-Brexit. And there are two dimensions to this, both of which are touched upon in the report. The first one was what Brendan referred to as the, the currency issue. I think we, it's fair to make an assumption that the relationship between the sterling and the euro is going to work to our disadvantage in the medium term. The second is that any movement towards uh, Britain's exit of the single market and customs union is going to have some element of, of trade restrictions, which will, again, will make it more difficult for us. So these two things together point to the requirement to, to really focus on how does Ireland uh, work towards an enhanced economic competitiveness over the medium to longer term, and what needs to be done in order to achieve that. Brendan made the analogy of the transitional arrangements that were made when, uh, in the late 1970s when uh, Ireland uh, moved towards economic and monetary union. There's an analogy that can go back even further, back in the 1960s, as Ireland realised that it had to prepare for more challenging times ahead. It, it looked at, so it had the, what was called the Committee of Industrial Organisation, where sector by sector we looked at our economy, where the weaknesses are, where the improvements were needed. So that, that sort of thing is, is going to be required. And, but we are in a much better position than we were in those f 50 or 60 <coughs> years ago. And this, I think, can be done. We are already committed to working harder on our trade diversification policy. So our conclusion I, I saw at the end of this report is that re we really are faced, Ireland, this, this Brexit issue uh, requires uh, us to realise that we, we, are, we have basic choices to make in our national uh, development policy. The government has taken the position, and there are very good reasons for this, that we remain a committed uh, member of EU27. 
Uh, and we, we take the consequences of that. We take the consequences of it in terms of, of uh, thinking through what we want from EU27 as it develops. But we also have, and history and geography dictates this, we also have a close connection with, with the UK and how we square that circle and how we keep those positive connections with the UK uh, to enable us to complete this negotiation as, pos as, as well as possible and to look to the longer term uh, basis of our relationship with the UK, that remains one of the key challenges as we go forward. So thank you very much indeed.